Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my November 2017 reading wrap-up. I actually did uh, better this month than I have ever, I believe, since starting NaNoWriMo <laughs> 14 years ago. I tended to sometimes completely uh, forego reading or only read one or two books, but uh, this month I got to four. It's a... Uh, trajectory that I hope to continue with, or at least plateau here, if not move on, <laughs> move on and up. <laughs> I also um, have posted segments of my Goodreads reviews for all of these books in my uh, literary newsletter. It is my monthly tradition to put out a literary newsletter where I highlight some uh, literary news of the world that is uh, of interest to me, and I put segments of book reviews and uh, books that I've added to my TBR, and I have a book pick that I uh, feature every year, and a book meme, and uh, I'll just put a link down below. I really enjoy doing those. The first book that I read I had to return to the library, alas, so I'll insert a picture. It's called Modern Girls by Ed Jennifer Brown. It takes place in 1935 on the Lower East Side within a Jewish family there where um, the mother, who is in her 40s, and her daughter, who is about 19, get pregnant at the same time, and uh, for both of them it is not what they want. <laughs> and because of the conditions back then, the social conditions of being a woman, and in general uh, looking down on uh, not careening into family life, especially when you're in a situation, <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of tension, and uh, the narrative goes back and forth between the characters, and uh, they actually uh, keep secrets from each other, and it, it moves very quickly, so, so it, the tension remains high, and it's like, oh, well, this is going on, but the other character doesn't know it yet, and makes another decision, and it gets complicated, and we go day by day, and it's uh, fast moving. <laughs> And I was surprised at uh, how much I was invested in the daughter's story arc. At the beginning, I kind of wondered if she'd be vapid, like, uh, just into fashion and whatever. <laughs> and uh, it did kind of break my heart that uh, the author made her out to be this uh, math whiz who really had a future and a career, but uh, I ultimately was not able to follow it. <laughs> uh, the ending for her, I thought, was rather intriguing. It was not sort of... Um, an easy ending uh, where things smoothed over quickly, but uh, I think that uh, it, it went in an interesting direction and uh, had the character sort of grow a little bit and uh, find new meaning in her life and that sort of thing. The mother's story actually didn't interest me as much. I thought it would, but uh, you know, she's brushing up against the Holocaust. She has family still in Poland that she's trying to get out, but uh, you know, when it comes to um, the Holocaust and the 30s and going through Jews trying to make sense of it, it, it's such a foregone conclusion, and obviously we didn't even see the end of it. We didn't see what happened to the family members. But, uh, I don't know, there's just something... Uh, it's a depressing little tease, I guess, when what we see is people getting nervous in the 30s and then end scene. <laughs> the stuff that was uh, more interesting was uh, the stuff that could actually be resolved. <laughs> One thing I also found very interesting was the push and pull between um, traditionalism and assimilation in uh, Jewish culture and how much I found myself rooting for traditionalism and finding it tragic when the characters were sort of forced away from that. Even though in the 21st century, my practice in, of Judaism is much more of uh, the assimilation route. Like, uh, here I am uh, bemoaning in the book, oh, we're losing Yiddish, and uh, I don't know any Yiddish, I know, <laughs> I, uh, except for phrases. And um, Reform Judaism in the book seemed kind of soulless, although I still uh, didn't necessarily like uh, the orthodoxy that was uh, shown to us uh, from a woman's perspective. You just sort of uh, sit in the back and gossip. But at the same time, I, I found it interesting that I was so turned off by uh, Reform Judaism. Uh, I, I'm not a Reform Jew, although uh, in this day and age I think a lot of the progressive Jewish strands uh, are more similar than not. And they're actually a lot different than what Reform Judaism was in the 30s when uh, people were so desperate to uh, not seem too Jewish. And uh, in America I don't necessarily think that's the case anymore. At least when you go to a synagogue <laughs> you're expected to seem Jewish. <laughs> So I found that interesting thematically uh, for the characters and also for me, I guess, as a Jew uh, thinking about these things. 
So yeah, I think it was a pretty solid book. Well, the next thing I read, I guess I can't say that I technically read because I listened to it on audiobook. I'd say this is my nod to uh, nonfiction November, although technically I think I read more nonfiction in October. So. <laughs> It was the third memoir I had left uh, from Carrie Fisher, I believe it was her second published, called Shockaholic. And I thought it would uh, center more succinctly on her electroshock therapy, but it really didn't. It, it centered more on uh, memories that I think she was uh, thinking about at the time that uh, she decided to undergo this therapy for the first time. And a lot of it had to do with death. The memoir was a series of essays, and, and even the essays that weren't about death within the essay often featured someone who was now dead. And uh, I think I, I have a lot of trouble divorcing uh, Fisher's work from uh, her ultimate fate, especially since she talks so much about depression and drug use and uh, wondering how her own death would be perceived. It really is sort of like speaking with a ghost. And... Uh, I thought she had interesting things to say in, in these essays. She uh, talks about the price of celebrity and uh, basic sexism within dating. And she has this really long and rambling final chapter slash essay about her father's death. And I found it fascinating, but at the same time, uh, it, it kind of rambled on and on. And uh, she was covering everything uh, in the ki and the kitchen sink, I guess. Uh, it, I mean, she was talking about her, her parents' relationship and uh, her father's relationship with Elizabeth Taylor and then her relationship with Elizabeth Taylor and then her relationship with her father as a youngster versus at the end of his life. And I think she had a little bit of guilt about... Uh, not being there when he died, although uh, she was his primary caretaker at the time. But I thought near the end she was starting to repeat her feelings, and her final sentence was so sort of inconclusive <laughs> that I was surprised when it, the next voice came on to say, like, thank you for listening to this audiobook or whatever. <laughs> so this one wasn't my favorite of her audiobooks. I, I, liked, uh, I liked what I heard. There was some repetitiveness, but uh, Overall, I, I liked her style, as always, but I think my favorite of her uh, memoirs is The Princess Diarist. I, I really want to, to, to read her novels now. <laughs> so much I want to read, but uh, I'm really curious how she deals with her life in her novels. <laughs> the third book that I read is uh, The Tumbling Turner Sisters by Juliet Fay. In it, we are following the Turner family, who, um, after the father has an accident and can't work for a while, uh, the sort of fame-hungry uh, mother <laughs> gets her dream come true in uh, pushing her daughters to do acrobats and vaudeville shows. And they're good enough, ultimately, to get an agent and uh, go to theaters uh, around the country and uh, learn life lessons. That part was a bit too heavy-handed for me, uh, the types of life lessons that they learned and... Uh, even a subplot with one of the daughters with um, an African-American man uh, starting up an affair and having to do it in secret, obviously, because uh, racism was rampant. I thought that was a bit heavy-handed. Um, the book also goes between two narrators, two of the sisters, one who is supposed to be more shy and retiring and more of an academic and one who is uh, more flirtatious and bold. But honestly, I couldn't tell much difference between the writing styles, and I often even got a little confused about who was narrating. So I don't think that was one of the strengths of the book. But I do think uh, I was very impressed by the level of historical detail in the book. And um, ultimately, um, the Shire sister gets involved with um, an Italian boy and... Uh, it's acceptable enough, I guess, that we don't have to focus on shock value as much and they get a little bit more character development and uh, get to talk about issues because, uh, like uh, women's suffrage because uh, the girl wants it and the boy's not so sure. <laughs> and uh, we're sort of just trundling along at that pace where we're just sort of uh, going through acts, which is another interesting thing to sort of see behind the scenes of what these uh, theaters might have been like. But it's sort of just trundling along until, like, there's a 10th hour uh, plot development that sort of uh, forces everyone into their uh, final uh, endpoints for their character arcs. 
another interesting thing about this novel is how um, Faye's great-grandfather was a vaudevillian and he, she actually uh, fictionalized him and, and his family in this book and I thought that was a pretty uh, uh, touching tribute, creative tribute at least. And the final book that I read was technically for my book club, but I didn't get to go to the meeting because NaNoWriMo! <laughs> it is No One Is Here Except For All Of Us by Ramona Ossibel. And it is another Holocaust novel, but this one worked a lot better for me. And uh, that's saying something because I tend to be a little wary of uh, Holocaust novels. There's a lot of them and... Uh, well, I mean, they can be a little repetitive, that's true, but also, you know, there's just more to the Jewish story, so I just sort of want to diversify in that way. But what I really liked about uh, this one was sort of a magic realism uh, tint to it. It takes place uh, starting in the early 40s when a uh, remote Jewish Romanian village hears its first uh, warplanes overhead, and then a uh, stranger washes upon their shores who uh, lost her family brutally when some... Uh, soldiers came to her village and they decide, they decide to start time over again as it were, sort of in the uh, spirit of Genesis. And I really like how they invoked uh, the Jewish history of persecution and migration and moving uh, forward. And even though they couldn't move anywhere because they knew that uh, most of the West was closed to Jews by this point, they just decided to pretend that nothing else was happening in the world and sort of to forget the past and to start over. And I thought there was some uh, interesting themes about what it means to excise the past and to start over. And some of it actually confused me a bit. There was a bit with the uh, protagonist, Lena, and uh, her family. And although I guess I found it a little interesting, I was like, what's exactly the point of this? But ultimately, when, you know, the real world catches up with them and Lena and her children go on the run, I felt like there was actually a point to all of that. Because a lot of, I think, what this novel has to do with is the absurdity of all of these events. The absurdity of genocide, the absurdity of persecution, of war. There's also a, a sort of subplot, I think, about just the World War II sort of more generally, although I don't think that worked as well, personally. I think I just respect this novel for how it tried to pull off talking about the Holocaust. It was not a fact-driven account, but I think it could go deep into what it meant to be a people who was per persecuted. And uh, I think it was a very emotional book and, and moving in that way. So that about covers it for me. I think it was a pretty decent uh, reading month. Uh, I liked the plotty fiction. I think it kept me going uh, when I had my mind so much focused on writing my own stuff. I actually found the literary stuff to be <laughs> more of a challenge, obviously, to read. I hope you all had a great uh, November reading month, and uh, I hope that you're meeting your goals for the year. And uh, personally, I, I'm gonna try to read a whole lot in December. I just, <laughs> I don't, I've been missing reading more, and also I just have so many books on the to-read list. Uh, so I'll see how I do, but, and I'll be back to update on progress more regularly throughout the month. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.